Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to another episode of Infinite uh, Universe Radio, where, of course, in an infinite universe, there are infinite possibilities. And we all know that I, and hopefully my listeners out here tonight, love possibilities. It looks like we have several live listeners, at least today. (laughs) Hello to all of you. Um, out there tonight, and hopefully everyone is indeed having a lovely winter Wednesday. Now, I am going to uh, tonight be talking with um, a young man who you might know from YouTube, Facebook, and various places around the internet as Enlightenment to all, or by a few other names. Discussing um, everything from the Mayan calendar to enlightenment, um, ideas of money or lack thereof. We might get into free energy. I'm not sure. It's all so open, and of course, he is a repeat guest who has been on and joined me before. And it does seem that there's quite a a bit of interest. 
Now I'll get to that in a, in a moment. I am just waiting for him to call in. At this point, he has not called yet and should within several minutes. And then, of course, I'll get right on into it. Now, now before I do that, and while we're waiting, I would like to talk a little about an incident that actually happened recently to me. I was saying, really not directly involved, nor did I get involved, but it certainly caught my attention. It certainly did indeed, and I wanted to share it with you folks out there tonight. It's because I wonder, maybe... Maybe I'm of a uh, wrong or, uh, of my opinion on this. But in any case, I remember recently at, at work having witnessed a lady with a child. I don't believe it was even her child. I believe it, it was her grandchild from what I, I gathered, from what I I assumed. But of course, my attention was only caught at the time that the young child, four or five years old, had been sat in a chair at the front of our store, which of course I like to leave up there for the people to wait for rides or taxis or just talk on the phone or just warm up inside. So she had been seated in the chair, parked in it, while her grandmother, I believe it was, hovered over her, head to head, staring down at her from where she sat in the chair. This was a small child and a tall woman, saying something like, do you hear me, do you hear me, do you hear me, repeatedly, over and over again, over and over, asking for some confirmation. The correct answer, of course, is a guess, and the child would not say it. To which was replied, all you have to say is a yes. All I wish to hear is a yes. And this somehow bothered me. I don't know. I don't know. Is it just me? Am I the only one who finds this sort of thing to be, in a way, almost creepy? And I'll tell you why. Because... Well, see, a child knows what it thinks, and a child knows if it hears. And for you to demand, I think, and of course, keep in mind, I don't actually have a child of my own, which is why I was curious about this, but it seems to me that all you would do if you're doing it, and I just really can get to a child's fame as anyone else, and of course you, anyone who listened to last episode would have heard my list on of tips for emotional survival in the modern age. But, of course, all you were basically doing is telling a child that they have no power. And the problem is they take this idea with them into life. And I wonder, like, is that what's wrong with the world today? The fact that we're teaching our children our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, whatever they are, whoever they are, from the age of four and up, that there is somebody bigger than them. There is always somebody above them. They must always answer to the man or the woman. (laughs) That to say to a five-year-old, you have no say, you have no power, you will speak when I tell you to, you do not control your voice, you do not control your ears, and it just bothered me. It just outright bothered me. And I don't know why it did, but it did. And I was meaning to bring that up last episode. But, of course, I had a lot to cover, and I just kind of honestly forgot all about it. So, of course, we do share your opinions on the Facebook page, which, of course, you can easily find from my um 
my page here on BTR Blog Talk Radio, you will find a link to its page. And I, I invite all of you, you know, to join my Infinite Universe uh, Facebook page. And of course, for all of you who are new and don't know me, my name is Chantel. And I am your your silly little host for the next hour, hour and a half. <laughs> and I will tell it everybody, and of course, probably hope if we're going to fully all get into the habit of doing this several times throughout the show, that uh, you can call in and talk to me, maybe to me and my guests. And if you wish to do that, call or Skype to us. Either way, um, 347 Want to reach me. And of course, indicate that you wish to talk to the host and... I will happily take your call, as as one well, my guest who has already said that he would be happy to do this. Now, of course, um, my my friend in, in enlightenment to all, Matt, is actually in queue and waiting for me for me here by the looks of it. So I'm just going to pick up his phone and we'll get right into this. Um, hello. Hello, Miss. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I've uh, prepared a great deal of content, and I hope to enlighten a few minds once again and get people thinking about their own potential and perhaps, you know, taking action and stepping into their own power. Okay. That sounds great. If there's something I think that the world needs at this time more than ever, it's stepping into your pa- into your own power we all know i love it and that subject too personal power and stepping into it yes i absolutely agree and uh it's encouraging as each day goes by i see more and more people actually doing so and you know educating themselves on what's happening yeah so where do you do you want to start off with this evening well i'd like to begin with the end of the 13th back tune of the Mayan long, excuse me, Mayan long count calendar. This is uh, the main subject I want to cover in wake of uh, just the wave of information that's coming out now about the 21st of December. It's getting very close now, and a lot of people are talking about it. It's, uh, yeah. People's, uh, people's thoughts are giving it a lot more power now, so it's, it's becoming seen more widely and broadcast more widely than I think it's ever been before. Well, earlier today I noticed I was driving home, and, of course, it, it hit me. This is about five or six weeks away. <laughs> yes, the it year is, has really wow. uh, the year has really flown, flown by, has it not? Oh yes, it has. All right, so um, basically, I'll explain first of all what a bok tun is, and uh, a bok tun is approximately twenty katun cycles of the ancient Maya long count calendar. And the calendar contains 144,000 days, which is roughly equal to 394 tropical years. And it's been, uh, let's see, the beginning of the 13th back tune, I believe, was around, gosh, I'm going to have to check my data on that. I don't have that available right offhand. But it's uh, it's been a long time coming, and it's in all the prophecies. You see it more and more on television now, on History Channel. It's, everybody just seems to be talking about it and taking interest in it now, that the end of this 13th cycle is coming, and it will be the beginning of the 14th cycle. Oh, wow. <laughs> and with this coming 14th cycle, it's uh, prophesied there's going to be a great awakening of the masses, an awakening of mankind. Um, some theories state that... People who have, you know, studied much of spirituality and have uh, reached a certain point of development in their lives will remember 
who they are and who they have been and who they will choose to become. It's it, You can get technical with it, but basically it's what many call the Akashic Record will be broadcast from the core of the planet into the entire galaxy, meaning all information up to that point will be available for reference or in many circumstances people will just remember it. I find that kind of thing is so exciting. Just with the idea, I'm thinking, you know, I've heard of this from other sources, and I can't help but think maybe things will finally make sense. Maybe I'll, I'll finally understand, and so so will seven billion lost or other lost souls here on Earth. Yes, we we can definitely hope that to be true. And I see more and more people who have claimed that this is what has happened to them already, myself being one of them. And it's it's a real life changing event. But it's it's I don't think it's gonna be this great disaster and apocalypse and everything that is prophesied. I think it's going to be more of a, a mental shift. People will just re- if they remember everything that was up to this point you can only think that that influx of information is going to be overwhelming at first. It was for me. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, I've been looking into this since about 08, but even then, it was just, it's always been overwhelming. And you know, too, this is kind of unrelated, but it is also interesting. I've been thinking, too, you know, kind of, the thing that I'm nervous about is not that, you know, something will happen. It's almost that nothing will happen. <laughs> yes, that's been one of the theories that people are saying as well. You know, what if nothing happens? But I, I still think even if nothing does happen, it can still be uh, used as a positive experience because a lot of people like myself and others who are just waiting for this date to go by. I think if it goes by and there is no great change, it will serve as a catalyst for them to begin acting. See, I had thought of of the same thing, that at the very least it will be sort of the final straw in a way that will force humans to kind of take uh, the power into their own hands. (laughs) You know, to kind of you know, enough is enough kind of that kind of thing? Yes, it's, it's going to serve as a catalyst one way or the other, I feel. And you have all the theories, of course, that tie into it. Some theories state there's going to be the uh, three days of darkness. Other theories state that there's going to be an eclipse of some sort. But in, in actuality, it's not really an eclipse. It's an alignment of the planets. And this will be seen, and this might cause, you know, mass panic. People are seeing this, and it's not been you know, publicized at all by NASA or any other organization. Okay, so if there is a mass alignment of all the planets, what would that actually even look like from Earth? Like to us even looking up at the sky? Or would well, it, it look like anything from, from the ground? From from what I've studied, it's going to appear somewhat like it would at dusk. There's going to be some kind of different glow to the earth the sky is normally blue it's going to tint to an orange color and it's it's going to affect all kinds of you know visible spectrum of light perceptions some people might be seeing what they call apparitions or ghosts others may be you know seeing nothing at all but they may feel something within it's it's going to be different for each individual but it's all going to be happening at the same time and it's going to be very quickly when when you get this mental sensation, it's not going to last very long. But if you don't hold on to the thoughts that you have and act on them, then nothing is going to happen at all. It's going to continue as it's been. The important thing is, if you do indeed have some kind of uh, mental epiphany, whatever you want to call it, on during these days, I suggest you write down whatever comes out and you act on whatever comes out. That's the most important thing I could tell anybody. Oh, wow. So I guess everyone out there, and of course myself, keep our journals handy, our little notepads and pens. 
to I award uh, Christmas time, and I'll be doing that for sure. <laughs> yes, I definitely would because this it's an extremely rare event, and if you have studied anything of physics, then you will know that an alignment of this scale, it will affect consciousness in one way or another. Well, that's it. I mean, everything is um, energy, even us. And that's the thing people miss, even us. We are energy, too. And, of course, if it affects everything else, we're part of everything else, <laughs> sort of. Yes, it's, it's really true, you know. And in a lot of my studies of physics and anatomy, it, it all ties into, you know, our, at our core, we are energy. And we can, you know, manipulate energy, we can absorb energy, we can project energy. But it's become so subtle now and it's so second nature to human beings, they don't think it's any more than that. They just think it's, you know, something that's, uh, what's the word? It's just, uh, it's, a, it's learned behavior, it's programming. Oftentimes when you're in a room and you feel uncomfortable and you feel that uncomfortable feeling coming from a certain direction... Chances are that someone over there is uncomfortable with your presence there, and they're projecting that energy to you. But many people would not even give that a second thought. They would just think, oh, it's a, a random emotion or whatever. When, in fact, that's telepathy. That's really, you know, you're really absorbing their energy, and it's affecting your emotion in that way. I've actually had that happen. Same, too, as walking into a room full of angry or aggressive people such as certain bars or clubs or even stores where, you know, there was a lot of people ripped off or whatever, I find, too, I mean, they walk into a certain place and once in a while, all of a sudden, it's just like anger. <laughs> or you just feel the feeling of somebody being angry. Yeah, a lot of people would be a lot better off if they learned to trust that instinct right away. Instead of dismiss it or think, you know, it's their own mental game or whatever. That's that's actually, you know, telepathic communication. It's just become so, you know, suppressed now that writing and words has taken over as the dominant language. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I teach a human how to paint on the walls of a cave... Give them a hundred thousand years, and you yeah, recognize you, you no longer truly know how to speak. <laughs> it's amazing when you when you take the grand scope of history and the present and the future, and you try to cram all that into one conscious experience. It's this is why a lot of people are you know mentally disturbed. They've probably had some kind of traumatic event like that. And when they try to explain it to somebody, they just, you know, right away stamp them as insane or disturbed or whatever. I've found a lot of people who are classed that way, they're very intelligent people. But you just have to know to communicate with them, and you must approach them with an open mind into all things. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. This, I mean, I... Oh, I'm sorry. This is, what the, this is what the Mayan priesthood was also trying to teach for the longest time, that you, you shouldn't judge based on your own perspective, and you should view that person as you would yourself. No matter how kind of outrageous it may seem, what they're doing, their culture, just try to take it in for a minute. You know, realize this is all they've known. This is how they've been raised. We face so much judgment in today's society because it's become such a a cold experience. You know, everybody has a television now. Everybody has work. Everybody has all these. Um, what I would call three-dimensional ticks to their life. And it's ticks like this that keep people from having the time to learn of extrasensory perception and all those things of the metaphysical. Uh, well, I've always thought, too, you know, in the day, I mean, you know, in the day, those in power, I suppose, are just sort of, and I've always noticed it, I'm, you know, just kind of, kind of bogging people down with the need to just attain things, you know, you've got to have the job to make the money to buy the food, so you've got to keep it there, a job, so you've got to work, 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 and it doesn't give you a lot of time to be telepathic, does it? 
No, it certainly does not. And it's, or to learn it's other skills. Path, it's the path of mass society. You you are born, you have your childhood, your parents give you your values, you go to school, you teach only what they want you to learn in school. They uh they suppress a lot of the, you know, superior mathematics and et cetera, things that could probably change the entire structure of high school. But they, if they did that, they know that people start thinking outside the box, and it may affect their profit in a detrimental way. And that seems to be the core issue is greed and profit is what is continuing to drive this world. And it's a it's very sad, very sad situation. Oh, yeah. And, of course, I know you're quite known for being against the monetary system. Yes, which I, I, I am agree absolutely, with uh, I am absolutely against money. I think the concept of money, it's it can work, but not in the way it's been presented to the United States and the world as a whole, because it's a debt-based currency, meaning there there is no getting out of it. It's debt-based. It has no real value. A lot of people, they'll look at you funny when you tell them that, but when you try to present the facts to them, it starts to open their mind a little bit. The prime example I give is uh, Executive Order 11110, which was signed by John Kennedy, and it stated that the Federal Reserve must begin printing silver bullion and silver certificates as opposed to Federal Reserve notes. And that would have, in fact, turned the entire economy from a debt-based economy into something that has actual value and worth. And it was shortly after this that, of course, he was silenced, and that was the end of that, and the Federal Reserve notes began printing once again. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Of course, when you try to present any of that information to either anybody who is uneducated about it or they uh, have a different agenda, they will try to dismiss it and they'll try to demonize you right away. And this is a way that a lot of people can tell who is speaking from their heart and truth and who is not. Because you'll find that the person who's speaking from the heart will acknowledge that they may be incorrect about said theory or said subject or whatever. But And when they ask the same of the opposing party saying, can you say the same? Can you say you might be incorrect as well? Often the opposing party will give no reply. And that's that's your red flag right there. So a tool of discernment, and it's a very valuable tool. I found it to work very well, and it's eliminated a lot of people who have been wasting time in my life. So I highly suggest it to everybody. Oh, well, thanks. So I know, um, and I'm not sure if you ever mentioned it actually on the on the show. I think you did. You were building some sort of technology. Is that yes, working? I, uh, Is it nearly done yet? I have uh, only the blueprints for it still. I hope to get the copper very soon. I've been uh, blessed with having some very kind people online invest into this idea. Um, given my studies of the idea, it can pretty much eliminate any need for a utility, for power. It can help people to become self-sustaining. It has many other properties as well. And it's interesting because the Maya also spoke of this same geometric figure. It's called the torus. And it's okay. what they called it, uh, what they call it is Maitreya, actually. And that was very fascinating to me when I learned that because I've studied much of that concept and the fact that the Mayans would directly call this geometric form, Maitreya, it opened my mind instantly. I was like, wow, that's really what this is. It's um, Think of something like a vortex. And what it does is it generates more energy than it's using. And in some cases, it can generate energy just from the ether around it. Nikola Tesla knew of this technology, and he was ready to give it to the entire world, but... His uh, investors were J.P. Morgan, and, of course, they realized right away if everybody started using this, there'd be no profit gain from their utility and their big energy corporation. And it's taken 70 years for, finally, it's starting to go mainstream now. Yeah. You know, it would be it was so very neat if you were able to, you know, turn this thing on on the 21st, but I guess they're not going to be ready in time. 
I, I do I do plan to have a working prototype ready by that time. I feel oh, really? I've, given, I've been given many signs that it needs to be completed by then by uh, friends, you know, and uh, other worldly sources. <laughs> but I feel that must be completed by then, and I plan to have a working prototype done before the 21st. Oh, wow. See, as you as you know, I've always loved um, free energy concepts, too. So, like, I would have loved to, you know, have, like, say, a water-powered car or something, you know. I got, I've always been into that sort of thing, so... Obviously, this is very cool, the idea of something that can generate, like, electricity for nothing. Yes, and the technology is there, too. That's one of the most tragic things, is this technology is nothing new. There really is nothing new in the wider perception, because time is, in fact, an illusion. It's just your conscious level of perception of time that leads to the experiences you will have. And as you said, water power cars, they're already running. They have several in Japan already. I've heard of this, too, and I thought it was it was fascinating. The only problem is, given human thinking, soon you'll have water filling stations that will charge as much as, as a gas, and you're not going to get ahead. But well, at least it's better for the Earth, if nothing else. <laughs> yes, and it's it's going to be absurd if they try to charge for gas. I don't think anybody would honestly pay for water to power their car. It's in such abundance. And that's why we have to keep these people honest. We have to keep the members of our government or whoever is governing over us, we must keep them under the microscope very carefully because they will try to trick us under a ruse of words for their own profit. Well, the thing is, though, up here, I don't know if you do this in the States. I know I commented to somebody... I think I've commented to several people because this is just annoying to me. Up here, they actually charge for air for your tires. So, I mean, they might charge for water fuel. Like, uh, they charge for air, like a compressed air for your tires. Like, who would, who would have thought, like, 10 years ago? <laughs> you just yeah, put your dollar in and you fill up your tires. <laughs> And it's because people accept it that it remains. If people would stand up and say, you know, we this is not something that is for our best interest. We shouldn't have to pay for air. But because everybody has accepted it and they continue to, it will remain. We have to stand up and we have to voice ourselves. And I feel that's another aspect of the 13th Bakhtun coming to an end, is that people will start to realize these things and they will speak up and they will initiate change. Any great idea starts small. It starts with humble beginnings. But then it has the snowball effect, and I feel that it's been coming for 70 years, as Tesla stated. He said that he worked for the future, which is his. And I can definitely see why he said that now. So, what will the next one bring us? The um, Fort Routines? Or does anyone have any idea yet? Or theories um, on this? I'm not sure of an exact date because I feel after the 13th Bactoon, there's going to be a completely different system of time. I think that the system of time we exist in now, well, most of us exist in, which is, you know, 12 months, Gregorian calendar, I think that concept is going to be eliminated. And there's going to be a different, quote, calendar, unquote, that comes to manifestation and that is widely accepted by everybody. And a lot of people don't realize what a great effect that will have on people's consciousness. Just to do away with one concept of time and initiate a new concept of time, it opens an an entirely new dimension of thinking. Well, well, sure. I mean, if if nothing else, such a big change is likely to kind of jumpstart the... the, 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 brain and just snapping out of it and going, well, what, I'm awake, I'm awake. Oh, wait, I'm here to think. <laughs> kind of. Just yes, exactly. because You're... it's coming so big and so different. Exactly. You, you make a good point there when you say, it's, uh, I'm awake. Because when you will come to a point in your life where you question everything that you've learned up to that point. And it's that point and the choices you make from there on that's going to determine whether you're going to continue down the same path or you're going to blaze a new path. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, I've already decided to go for the new house. <laughs> Got my uh, bag packed and everything. Not literally, of course, but... <laughs> and that kind of ties into the next subject I've prepared here, which is uh, occult magic. Oh, great. Okay. So, many are going to dismiss it right away because you use the word magic. So, I just, to those people I ask, simply keep an open mind. Okay. Okay, when, when you begin to study occult magic, you'll find that it's ancient. This is very old, ancient writings and uh, rituals. It's as old as writing itself, because writing is magic. It was because of writing that the pyramids were able to be constructed. You have to give man something they can see. That's what most of mankind bases everything off of, is what they see. They can hear something, but if they don't see it, it, they don't really acknowledge it. So right away, when you invented writing, you've already invented magic itself, because you're using your writing, be it in a positive or a negative way, to influence somebody's thought form. Okay. So with the dawn of writing came the dawn of pretty much measurement and time itself because they're all measurements. And one of the newer aspects of occult magic is time magic. And it, I can tell you that it is very real. It's also very subtle, and a lot of people are doing it and having no clue that they're actually doing it. In, um, during World War II, the Nazis had a division that they called the Thule Society. And these gentlemen were very into occult magic and specifically time magic. When you look at the swastika, many people think it's a Nazi symbol. When in fact, the swastika is an ancient symbol. It goes way, way back behind anything that the Nazis came around with. It's a vortex. And the vortex is the key to time travel itself. See, there's, there's different forms of time travel. You have the mental aspect, which is the time you perceive and the time you create and the time that you acknowledge. Then there's the manifestation when time travel becomes physical, where you actually travel back in time to a different period that you experience and that you see. And there are many documented cases of this. A lot of them are uh, covered up under a ruse of a plane crash, when in fact the plane did not crash and it entered what I call a electromagnetic vortex say, around the Bermuda Triangle, where many planes have been claimed to crash, when, in fact, the plane goes through this temporal rift and it emerges in another time period. And, of course, you never hear of them ever again. That's interesting, Richard. It's very difficult to grasp. You have to have an open mind to even begin to consider these things. But the evidence is there. A lot of physicists will agree that time travel is, in fact, possible. And it happens all the time. I mean, you know, I've often heard, and I'm not sure where I just know I pick up in for all over the place. I'm sort of a, you know, random fact hoarder. I have often heard that time travel would work by simply folding folding uh, the dimensions over themselves, which it, which in theory, can be done. Of course, I'm no real physicist, but it makes sense if you think of every dimension as a layer, almost like a sheet of paper. I always yeah, thought that was so interesting. It's interesting you mention that, as that is one of the aspects of occult magic. The, uh, the third okay. degree has some uh, literature on folding time, but it also states that say you're trying to fold time to make it go faster. You can do that, and your perception of time will be faster, but there will come a point also where the time has to unfold. So if you fold time in one direction, it will unfold at some point in your perception the other direction. Meaning, say, you fold time to quicken an event. So after you experience the event or whatever, there comes a point where time just seems to be going really slow. 
and uh, things are taking forever. This is, in fact, the time that you consciously fold it unfolding itself because time is a constant. It's uh, like a timeline. It's constant until you reach a certain dimension of it in which it becomes infinite. Okay. And some of the practitioners who are actually consciously manipulating time, they use methods like folding and unfolding and halving and things like that, which goes right back to mathematics. And mathematics itself is magic. Pretty much any form of science you can attribute to illusion and magic. It's the same thing. It's just a different perception of it. A lot of the old scriptures call it magic. And, of course, as we evolved, we adapted new terms, new words to help and better understand it. But it, it, it's in actuality the same thing. Science is magic itself. The thing is, in our society, everybody loves it that there is science, and I do too, but they, they don't so much love the magical or the unknown. <laughs> yes, they perceive it as something that's you know, mechanical, something that's digital. They don't perceive what is really happening there, the actual magic that's taking place accompanied with the technology that makes it happen. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, the, I've always hoped anyway that the human mind would just start to at least begin to comprehend you know, further, and I suppose that that could all happen in 2013. It's going to happen much sooner than a lot of people realize, because when oh, wow. when you when you start a movement and when you start to build these devices, such as the toroidal geometry, this affects the entire planetary consciousness. It spreads, meaning what you study, another person will become interested in studying. And they'll pick it up right away, and of course they'll see it, and they'll start building it. And before you know it, we're going to have a complete society of self-sustaining people. And granted, barter will still probably exist for eternity, but it's going to be a much more open barter and a much more fair barter, because everybody will already have abundance. They'll have all the luxuries of today without any need for profit or greed itself. And a lot of people are not going to be able to handle that. Some people base their entire life and perception off of greed, and I don't know what's going to become of these people. Uh, they're just they're not going to have any space in this new society. Well, I'm sure it'll all work out in some form or another. Like I've always imagined, as far as I gathered from my understanding of it. Okay, that was, I'm sorry, that was an extremely convoluted sentence I just, I just said, but <laughs> I gathered from what I understood, <laughs> but no, from what I understand, it seems to me, and this is the theory I like, that anybody who's not ready simply isn't, and that they will just continue to exist as though nothing's happened. I, I don't believe they will, you know, die or anything, or disappear. I, I would not be inclined to agree with that theory. I don't, I don't really know how it's going to happen, but I just feel that it will happen, and there's, there's all these, you know, subliminals they give us from Hollywood and the television, and that's occult magic too. It's, it's everywhere. If you just look for it, you'll notice it. A perfect example is the Harry Potter series. And I watched, I believe, the final two installments of that, and I was overwhelmed at the amount of symbolism and subliminal messages within. And if you try to tell that to, you know, your normal person, they're not going to see it at all. But when you discuss that with someone else, they're going to notice the same thing that you noticed. So it's clearly more than a coincidence. They've been doing it for many, many years. It's just become a lot more prevalent with the dawn of television and broadcasting, Well, yeah, I mean, now we're in a society, you can broadcast a single 
image around the world in seconds. <laughs> of course, they're going to take advantage of it. And, if it, and of course, it's not all bad. I mean, in theory, if you can broadcast something bad, you can also broadcast something empowering. And I think some do. I agree, and that's that's the parable of that humanity is facing with the coming of this new, you know, Bactoon, I think. Is you're going to either look at it in a positive aspect or a negative aspect. And from that point forward, you're going to walk down that path. And I, I honestly believe that more people are going to choose a positive aspect. I've seen recently in the United States there's been a lot of uh, news stories circulating about states that are wanting to secede from the Union. Now, granted, the amount of signatures gathered has only reached the minimum threshold needed to even bring this to light at all, the subject. But that's more than what's happened in the last however many years since the Civil War. So clearly there's much unrest within the American people about the election. I'm not sure if seceding from the Union is the proper way to go about it, but it definitely it's something that's going to get people thinking and talking about it, and that's good. That's That signals uh, some kind of need that things have to change very soon. Oh, yeah. I take it. Just the fact that everybody's talking or even even uh, even listening uh, to be a, a good sign. It's a sign of something. Exactly, and it is. Because when the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, the more power you give to that idea. And that's why money's become so powerful now. Everybody thinks about it. Everybody wants it. Everybody gives their thoughts to it. Therefore, they're giving it more power over themselves and over those who control it. It's very it's very simple. It's It can be very complex when you try to understand every single intricacy, but anybody with a noble heart and mind will perceive it very simply. It, it doesn't have to be this way. No. I think we're at a, a point, at least this is how I perceive it, that more and more we're at, at least seeing the people who have finally at least begun to understand. Maybe they don't have the answers. I mean, I don't, you, I don't think anybody has the full solution. But people are finally starting to understand that maybe there's at least something more out there. There's at least another option. I agree. And it's, you're right. You know, not everybody has the total answer. But when people begin to work together, they find pockets of other people who do have that answer. And when they work together, <clears throat> everything falls into place perfectly. If we could just unite and put aside all differences, things would happen so much faster. And that's... uh. I feel that's what's going to happen very soon. It's going to take a catalyst in order to tip the scales in our favor, but I think it's going to happen a lot sooner than people think. And definitely, if there's some sort of celestial event that everybody bears witness to, that's going to serve as a big catalyst as well right away. So in some ways, I'm actually hoping that it does occur. You know, I don't wish for any kind of disaster, meteor, etc. But if there was an eclipse that nobody was expecting they're going to start asking questions right away. It's going to be a mass awakening, I feel. Yeah. I mean, it's at least not going to make people look up and wonder how that happened and then look up how it could have happened and then talk to each other about how it happened and off you go. And the funny thing I noticed, do you realize, and I'm sure you have, that as you spoke about the idea a little earlier of people doing more and more and more and branching out and out and out, you basically described the human version of the power vortex. You had exactly. just described. It's the same thing. It's creating something bigger out of less. And I thought it was neat. I, I saw the... the, the um, cool little uh, uh, parallel there between vortex power and like vortex thinking I suppose yes you, you do make a good point there it's, uh, it's a fractal 
It's it's just like breath itself. You breathe in and you contract and then you breathe out and you expand. And it's the same can be said of anything that most of humanity deems as alive. If you're alive, you're consuming and you're producing something. That seems to be the most common parable in any current conception of something that's alive. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Except it seems like from what you're describing, for the first time ever, we will be producing more than we consume. Making each ring of the vortex larger? Yeah, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be emerging on the other side of the zero point, the center. And it's interesting because the Maya had a very advanced mathematical system. And instead of just the zero, they saw the zero as a spiral. And I believe that this is what created their uh, perception of this geometry, this toroidal geometry. And even in the games they played, they had a game that was similar to basketball where you tossed a sphere through a ring. It's just it's dominant in all Mayan culture. And from what I've heard of my studies... When you get 13 people that work with this geometry, it creates a, um, quote, pyramid of consciousness, unquote. And this consciousness is infinite. It will always remain as long as you had 13 people that work with the same form of geometry. It's permanently embedded into the planetary new sphere. Oh, wow. Have you found 12 others yet? I, I'm trying to educate others. I, uh, once I have a working prototype, I feel I can begin to organize events in my area, meetings. Because, again, you're not going to get people on board until you can actually show them what it does and they see it. Oh, yeah. This, this, this technology is something that you have to really see to appreciate. And once you see it, you, you start thinking, wow, look at that. Look at, look at what else that can do. And instantly it, it changes your whole perception of the world. And in my studies, that's, in fact, what the Taurus is. It's a whole to fourth-dimensional consciousness in three-dimensional geometry. And you see it symbolized in many things, the circle, the halo over the angel's head, um, the thornlet that Jesus Christ wore. It's the same thing. It's, it's trying to give people the message in the fourth dimension that can't be conveyed in a third dimension. Oh, okay. And it's also the key to, like, time travel, as I said. It's when you see this geometry, it will do something to your consciousness. It, it, it has some kind of effect on you. You may not acknowledge that for years to come. But it, if sooner or later you're going to, it's going to hit you, and you're going to be like, wow, that's what that was. And, you know, everybody knows about the 13 bloodlines of the, that supposedly rule this world, and you can only wonder... How have these bloodlines kept everything under their order so long? And then when I heard about the toroidal geometry and how it permanently etches consciousness into a planetary sphere and thinking, I think that's exactly how they've done it. And you know that actually adds up if the if the facts are all correct, it makes total sense. And of course, you see the number thirteen. A lot. Like, it's sort of the number of people have feared, but you do see exactly. it a lot. Exactly. It's, it's always conveyed as a number of fear, like the 13th floor in a building, the Friday the 13th, or you can go even to the tarot. The number 13 is the death card. That's what the occult tries to do. They try to imprint fear into anything that they practice. So it will discourage people from trying to do those things. Because that, that, in fact, is stepping into your own power. It's nothing evil. It's nothing wicked. You can use it for that purpose if you choose to. But you can just as well choose it to do good with it. Well, I mean, yeah. And that's the whole thing about um, free will. We have it for a reason. Maybe this is the reason. And, yes, and that also brings in the question... 
you know, the people that do choose to do these evil and wicked things, they, you know, perhaps they ultimately have a noble cause that can be shrouded underneath all of the wickedness they've done. When, in fact, perhaps they're teaching humanity not to be so naive, not to trust in your government, not to trust in anything outside of yourself. And, of course, they'll probably never admit that, but i have that's a theory I often come across in speaking with people about this subject is, you know, they must be doing this for a reason, to try and help us in some way, even if it comes across as something horrible or terrible. See, that, I'm not sure. Like, I would think that they don't really mean it or know they're doing it. However, we as humans can choose to take a good out of anything negative. For example, you know, you get into a car crash, hit a uh, fence, total the car and break your leg. You you could spend the next five months, you know, grunting and groaning, oh, I wrecked my car, I hurt my leg, I'm injured, you know. Or you could choose the positive and say, well, the insurance company helped me get a newer car and I learned to drive safely on the ice in the winter, you know, because I don't want to crash again. So, I mean... I think it's just a matter of take from it what you will, but there's a good to be found in anything. In anything negative, I suppose? Exactly. I agree totally. It's 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 how you react to the situation that's ultimately going to matter. You can take any great situation and you could turn it into something bad and you, vice versa. It's your reaction that matters. It's your reaction that will define you. And many people would do well to acknowledge that and they would begin acting in a much more civil manner, I feel. Well, yeah. But, of course, it's it's the whole human thing. Emotions come into play, and a lot of the times emotions take over. Everybody knows that. It's that Emotions are a very difficult mastery, and it's tied directly into humans. That's one of the main things that comes with human beings is emotions. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Humans are all over. I've, I mean, I noticed all over the place. We can be happy one second, and the next we're ready to, at the worst case, put a hole through a wall or, or some other such thing. You I don't agree. see that too often in other animals. Well, animals, they, they're going to survive a lot of these supposed coming catastrophes because they help one another. They operate on a different consciousness level than most of mankind does. And there was a time that mankind did think like the animals. We only thought of ways to survive. We never thought of seeing a reflection of ourselves so that we could learn from that and maybe, you know, begin to build. At some point in history, I think that we were bestowed with something from the heavens or whatever you want to call it to begin thinking differently. Developing the metaphor. It just seems over the history of mankind that there's these great evolutionary leaps in consciousness. It happens in a short period of time when you compare it to the grand scheme of everything. And I feel that's what's happening right now. I think we're in another one of those cycles where evolution is making a great leap forward. Oh, yeah. And I've said it it'd be before, and I'll continue you to say it. What a great time to be alive. <laughs> Front row seats, which is something big. <laughs> it surely is. And, and I'm always thankful for every day that I have. I've uh, been a lot more grounded lately, a lot more humble. And I'm finding that it's helping me quite a bit develop to, you know, develop my own consciousness and try and help the world as a better. Spending a lot more time in nature, a lot less time in front of the television, making better choices in what I decide to eat. It's uh, It could benefit everybody. They just have to come to that point in their life where they say, this is it, you know, I need to change. For me, it happened very quickly. But for others, it takes a long time, and that's part of their path, you know. You don't want to impose too much on their free will. Oh, no. As I always say here to to people, you know, take from anything what you will, and to each each of your own. But here's my opinion. 
I agree. Let's, uh, I've gone off subject a little bit here. Forgive me. Yes. It's all right. Um, okay, let's get back into the time magic here. And the oh, okay. So, when you're thinking about time travel and uh, a time machine that was created, you have to also realize that the moment this time machine was created, that from that point forward, time is infinite. You've broken through to infinite time. Whoever was in this time machine could have traveled back and influenced history. They could have changed the scope of everything by traveling back in time and influencing society with their ideals from the future. And that, it's kind of, you know, a parable to what the situation we've gotten ourselves into now. They only teach you what they want you to learn. And at some point, I think whoever is part of the current hierarchy did in fact go back in time and influence society to develop in the exact fashion it has up to this point right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hello? It's in it's interesting oh, you are because still there. sorry. No problem. It's interesting sorry, because I... that uh the Nazis really came to power after they had their expedition into Antarctica. And my studies tend to show that Antarctica is not the land that people think it to be. If you've heard of the hollow earth theory, it ties directly into that. At some point, the Nazi scientists went down there and they acquired some kind of knowledge or information that they did not have before. And when they came back, they had all this advanced technology. They were involving themselves in time manipulation. They were building stealth bombers. There, there's something there that they found that was it changed, you know, their whole consciousness, the entire grasp they had of science. And over history, you see other similar stories like that. When uh, Leo Denard, excuse me, Leonardo da Vinci went into the caves, and he said that he had some kind of epiphany in there. And when he emerged, he had all these ideas, like the uh, helicopter, and his art went in a new direction. You can only wonder what's really what's really underneath the surface of this planet. I think there's definitely something there that is suppressed and that they don't want people to know about. I can only guess what's under there. But hollow earth is always a cool subject. <laughs> And it ties right into the boom in electricity and all that. It, uh, a lot of Tesla's work stemmed from uh, just the beginnings of these concepts of flight and, you know, um, toroidal energy, sound waves, acoustic levitation. That's another one of these newer aspects that's coming to light now is this acoustic levitation. You can basically levitate an object with sound alone, just the sound waves around it. Okay, I feel that, that I haven't ever heard of, so this is interesting. Yeah, go ahead and look it up. It's called acoustic levitation. And I honestly feel this is what the Egyptians were using to build the pyramids, moving those giant stones. I mean, of course, I think there was a lot of physical labor involved, but I also think that they had a lot of advanced technology that people don't give them credit for, such as plasma technology. That's another one. It's um, reactive energy. You take two elements, two compounds, and they re when you combine them together, they react and form energy. It's, I believe this is what they used to light the pyramids with, was this plasma tech. Oh, wow. And, of course, that would have applied to um, the Mayans, but also ancient Egypt. Another advanced instead of society for its time, as I understand it. That's interesting. Yes, it's really it's really fascinating. And the more you learn about it, the more you'll see that it has, in fact, been being suppressed for a long time. And it's interesting to me that Iran is really pushing this technology now, the plasma technology. The Keshe Foundation is one of the big uh, scientific groups behind it. And every day, more and more, I see the war rhetoric coming more and more. We need to invade Iran. That's what the politicians and the media is trying to push. Now, of course, there's lots of oil over there, and it's a strategic location to hold. But at the same time, you can only wonder, if we do end up invading Iran, I'd, 
I imagine they're going to try and completely abolish any work that was done on this plasma technology. I think a vaccine is just playing them awful. And when, when you start to look into these things, you begin to realize that everything is planned. There is no coincidence ever. Every earthquake, every everything is planned. They have the technology to do these things. But they do it in such a fashion that they have kept it under a veil for a very long time. More people are starting to see through that veil now. A prime example is Iceland. They've completely reformed their whole financial system there. They've uh, re forgiven all the debt mortgages. They've gotten away from the Bank of England. And since this has happened, what has occurred in Iceland? They've been having more earthquakes. They've been having more volcanic activity. And I can only question, is that natural? I don't think so. Same thing with Japan. It was shortly after Japan devalued the dollar that they were hit with that giant earthquake. And, of course, that crippled the nation, and it continues to. Yeah. Not to mention the radiation. But then that's the a whole other issue. Yeah. Is that every, every fault line, it seems to have a nuclear plant on it or near it. And that's not a coincidence. That's been planned. You have to at least acknowledge that that could be true. It's very, it's a sinister thing to think about, but it, it is it is a very sinister conspiracy that goes on every day. I don't like to use that word because you get the red flags right away, but my studies show that it's indeed real. And it's much older, more ancient, and more sinister than anybody could ever fathom. Oh my gosh. That both makes a sense and a great it concerns me. And that's why we need to acknowledge it and we need to step up and say things about it. We uh we can't continue to let ourselves be governed by people that have broken our trust, that continue to feed us lies, they continue to you know, they serve only their own agenda, be it for whatever reason. I honestly think that they're waiting for us. They're waiting for us to stand up and take a stand. And I think that when we do, we finally do, they will acknowledge that and they will not push their agenda anymore. They'll, in fact, begin to work with us. We just have to get to that point where we're finally there and we're finally united and we say we're going to take over the government. We're going to govern ourselves. I've often thought of the, the idea of such a thing, and that reminds me of something that, that I was discussing earlier with a co-worker of mine, which really has nothing to do with 2012 or government. I just thought it was interesting that you mentioned it tonight, not uh, six hours later. Yes, uh, that's another one of the synchronicities that's happening. There is so much synchronicity going on right now with people who are researching because they come to someone else and they see that they're studying the same thing. They have similar thought forms. We, we're, being, we're being guided to unite with one another to do things. Again, everything is planned. My perception of life and reality is that everything I've set myself to do and accomplish, I've already done. I'm just enjoying the show right now. It's, it's a movie of sorts. You're simply living a memory that you've already had. And, of course, you can alter it. You can change it to whatever you want. But since I've begun thinking in this pattern, I've noticed that the resources I need, the people I need, the information I need, it comes to me naturally. I don't even really have to look for it anymore. It's just there. I can't, I can't even avoid it. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a good synchronicity. If only I could get them working so well for myself, I'd really be in the, in the business. When am I starting to get the hang of it? It, it's nothing that can be rushed. Everybody develops at their own pace. And it's just, uh, quote, coincidence, unquote, that many of us are developing faster now because we've been, we've opened our mind to this whole new dimension, a whole new world of thinking. And it, in fact, exists. It always has existed. 
And there's going to be a point where we perceive in that reality where a whole new world opens. That's infinity itself. It's when you think you have it all under wraps, the rules change. And it's, it's a, you got you have must learn again. You have to unlearn everything you've learned and learn anew. I guess that's our that's our gift. That's the biggest gift humanity has been given is the chance to develop and learn through all of this great hodgepodge of everything we experience. Oh, wow. And with the coming boom in technology, I think things are going to be a lot easier to circulate. Information that was once, you know, inaccessible will become accessible with relative ease to people. And there's there's just such an incredible boom in technology recently with, you know, nanotech and 3D printing. 3D printing is going to be the new big thing, I think. Everybody's just going to start printing their own tools, their own materials. You can even print food. It's it's one step away from the replicators you see on Star Trek. It really is. Oh, yeah. See, I've often thought, too, about how, you know, how great it would be to have such technology in our lifetime. I believe it could be done. I just, again, it's, it's about pressing the knowledge to keep control of the money to keep control of the people. Because you can control the money, you control the people. Control the people and you control the world. Exactly. And it's also uh, the weather. You control the weather, you control the world. And there's lots of weather manipulation going on right now as well. Oh, yeah. Like I had a, Hurricane I had a friend Sandy, recently. I don't know. Oh, sorry? Yeah, I was just going to say, Hurricane Sandy. I had a friend recently who was affected by it. And uh, he came online, and we were having a debate, and I told him, if I told you that the man you voted for, Barack Obama, had direct knowledge that Hurricane Sandy was going to be steered into your area, would would that change your perception of, you know, maybe I shouldn't have voted for him? And so I started him down the path. I gave him a few links to, you know, um, weather manipulation and how it works and, you know, current maps that they have, resources, where you can see the current electromagnetic readings for that area. And it's what it showed was about a week before the hurricane came ashore, there was a long wave frequency that began to peak right as it came ashore in that area. I honestly believe that he, well, I don't think he himself did it, the globalists, I guess I would call them, steered this storm into the Northeast for their own agenda. Because Barack Obama was campaigning in the Northeast just before the storm hit. And I'm sure he was telling people, if the storm doesn't come ashore, I promise you aid, I promise you this and that. And it garnered him any more votes, I'm certain. Oh, my gosh. You really have to think about that sometimes. It's, it's difficult to acknowledge something like that for most human beings. But all the studies are there and the facts are there. That's what many people are coming to realize now. just seems like a sad state, state of affairs. Of course, I do believe in change and hope and, and of course, in love and harmony and all that fun stuff. And I do think we can make it. I just wish that it didn't, it didn't cost it so much to make it, if that makes any sense to you. It, it Nowadays, does make sense like, to me. It does make sense to me, but again, at the same time, if things have not developed that the way they have up until this point, I don't think that there would be so many people waking up and realizing these things. Even if you take away one event, say Nagasaki, the bomb that exploded there, never happened. Think of the impact that would have on the future. It would have such a vast impact that, you know, everything might not have happened as it has up until this point in the timeline. I can't change anything, and it sort of snowballs outward in the timeline. It's it's easy to think that, oh, we could have done away with that, and that didn't have to be. But when you say those things, you must realize what you're altering there. You, you're altering your current future right now. A lot of people don't, don't, they just have no idea what they're wishing for, what they're thinking about, 
the effects that that really has on the future. It's like a stone being thrown into the ocean, the ripple of the water. A tiny pebble can cause a great ripple. Maybe that's something all of us need to consider, too, the next time we want to we we regret a mistake in our own lives or some such thing. Yeah, you can you can either perceive it as this happened, I regret it, you know, I wish it never happened, and you can dwell on that, or you can perceive it as it's happened. Let's build from here. Let's see it as you know a step that we took. Well, yeah, if you can't change the past, at least make a better future than the one you would have gotten had you done nothing but dwell on the mistake. Exactly. And that, that's another one of the biggest advices I could ever give to anybody is, again, it's not the event itself that matters. It's how you react to the event that matters. Yeah. Well, I always try to stay positive and positive and look at it, the bright side of things, much to the uh, dismay of several people in my life. But... I would say the biggest risk to positive outlooks, and this isn't a huge risk at all, it leads to some funny situations, is that you tend to be taken for uh, for uh, a naive fool. <laughs> I agree, and that's uh, that's become programming of society. Many people look for someone; they see, you know, they evaluate them on whatever level they have intellectually. If they can use them to their advantage, they will. But if the person is intelligent enough, then they already know that they can't be used to their advantage. Oh, for sure. And it's, then, it's, and almost like a, it's almost like a child, you know, a playful child who doesn't really know any better. All they know is, this can benefit me, this can make me happy. And that's, I honestly feel that that's how those who are in control... That's how their thought forms work. They act as children. They don't think of the greater good for all. They continue to drag out an agenda that seeks to, that seeks to you know, delay things and delay what's going to be inevitable. Mm-hmm. Again, I can only offer my own human perspective on it. It's flawed. I have my flaws as anyone. And, of course, I will probably make many points that I may contradict. But, again, that's uh, that's just part of the learning process. Being human, and I would just like to say too, we have just over 10 minutes um, left on the air here. Um, okay, 12 minutes left in the air. If anyone has any questions either in the chat room, that's okay. Um, post them and I'll ask them. Or if someone would like to call in, has been hoping to, but it didn't, go ahead and call, and I'm sure my friend here will be happy to answer you at 437-884-9479. I guess I see some of the questions in the chat room now. Gentleman makes an interesting point about the cell phone towers here. You know, in my studies, cell phone towers are a form of free energy. And they can, in fact, power homes or just about anything that requires electricity wirelessly through these cell phone towers. Tesla had a similar design. But, they, of course, they're only going to push it as the agenda. There's, they're only cell phone towers. But simply look around. Where are most of the cell phone towers located? By government installations, by hospitals, by schools? That's no coincidence. And, of course, it ties right into, oh, well, they need to be in this area because this is a populated area. See, they, for every point you make, there's already a counterpoint they have, a counterargument. Well, yeah, it seems everything is covered and everything is thought of. It's, it's the whole thing of it's multidimensional, multidimensionality, excuse me. Everything is multidimensional. You see it as one thing, but you can also see it as many other things. Just like the toroidal geometry itself. Yes, it's a form of free energy, but it can also be a form of, you know, alternate.
altering consciousness, or it's also anti-gravity technology. It's just it's multi-dimensional thinking. The more people we can get thinking multi-dimensionally, the better things will become as a whole for all of us, and the sooner. We'll and there's more and more people now that are developing this ability to see all these plot holes in history and to do the math and see that things don't add up the way that we've been raised up to think they have. There's just too many, you know, plot holes in it. Something's wrong. And the more people that attain this ability, the more truth that's going to come out. And many people are not going to be ready for the truth. It's going to be shocking. It's going to be devastating. It may alter their complete outlook on life and religion itself. But ultimately, it is going to happen. And again, it's how you react to it that's going to determine your future. Yeah. I see humans now, and of course this is just my uh, my opinion, but I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh yes, I was going to say, I see it now, just my opinion only, as so many people are now seem, seeming to be in this state of they want to know and yet they don't. I mean, as I've often said to people so many times, and of course I'll say it, say, say it again, no wonder people are going crazy. I mean, there's just... It's um, like being shut into a... a, to, a um, to a... to a, um, a box that, that you want to get out of, but it don't feel safe outside of... You're oh, exactly right. feeling safe you're inside exactly or right outside. It, you're exactly right on that. It's Stepping out of your comfort zone can be very disorientating. It can be very fearful. It's like coming from a world of black and white into a world of color. You're you're instantly just completely overwhelmed. The information overload is it's very, very difficult to accept. And it, for me, it happened very quickly. And I, I definitely understand why people could go insane from it very quickly. These... This kind of information, it it just completely twists your mind. You have to have a very strong mind to be able to comprehend it and then to be able to acknowledge it as, yes, that is indeed what I've been experiencing. A lot of people will rebel against that. And that's what ends up with, you know, these all these uh, disorders they like to label us with, bipolar, Asperger's, etc. I don't see those as a flaw. I just see those as another dimension of that person. To me, it's it's a good thing about that person. Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, I know folks of all, you know, all types and quote-unquote disorders. And I don't think there's anything, you know, negative about them. Like, no, of course, are. if you look at it, the word disorder, it's like disorder, chaos. Well, exactly. That doesn't exactly. there, there's, quite sum there up is a person. Wrong. No, it's like that word just doesn't fit humans anyhow to say a human has a disorder. It's like, basically, it can only mean something chaotic in the brain or in the body, and I suppose, but it's not really quite accurate. Excellent point there. Excellent point you make. Okay, it's, don't don't judge a book by its cover. That's that's a great piece of advice because a lot of people who you think may not be intelligent at all or whatever, you'd be very surprised as to what they know. So just don't judge a book by its cover ever. That's just showing complete ignorance, and you're only really harming your own personal experience through doing something like that. Well, yeah, well, for sure. And I mean, and we never assume. If somebody can't or won't be able to, these are the things that just drive me up the up the wall. <laughs> is that the world is full of cats, and I must say that I must say, you know, I'd love to help you get rid of that cat, but I don't have a back, backward can opener. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, that's, uh, I see we're almost about to go here, so I'd just like to make my closing yeah. uh, statements here. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Okay, the first of which 
Anybody who's listening to this, I would like you to research uh, CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is a device, I believe, that is manipulating time. They say they're searching for the God particle. What actually they're searching for is the anti-particle. And what that is, is it's the reverse spiral. If, you, if you'll study CERN, you'll see that it's just one big toroidal coil. And it, it's, but the spiral in the coil is only orientated toward one direction, which I believe is clockwise. And what the Mayans are talking about in this toroidal geometry, the Maitreya, they operate on a different spiral, the antimatter spiral, the uh, antiparticle spiral, I guess you call it. And it's, this is the spiral that is leading toward the past at least in consciousness, not so much in physicality, but consciousness. It's What they've done is they've captured their consciousness in the 13th pyramid, as I've said, but due to this spiral motion of it, the consciousness within is geared more toward the past and, you know, an, an older form of thinking, whereas CERN and the Large Hadron Collider is sort of toward the future and toward, you know, a lot of the aspects that are currently in place, such as control, such as, you know, all of those things of a negative nature. Mm -hmm. There's one positive spiral oh. and one negative. I'm sorry to interrupt here, but we have a caller who I believe is trying to call in at the in, in at the end of the show here. By all means. Do you mind if I bring them on board? By, by all means. Okay, I'm just going to grab him or her then. Um... Hello, this hey. is Infinite um, Universe um, Radio. Hello. Hello. Hey, Matt, Hello, what's sir, up? How are you? Good, it's, uh, it's Anthro. Ah, oh, welcome to the show. Thanks, brother. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Just uh, cool. trying to enlighten others. Awesome. Great job, man. Great show. Well, thank you. I have to thank my host as well. Um, did you have a question? Uh, not really. I was actually really getting into what you were just saying. I was actually willing to wait until you were done. Oh, concerning the spirals. Um, uh, oh, yeah, well, that, uh, you were t you were talking about the CERN and uh, the time, uh, the you know, the uh, past uh, thinking kind of influence uh, from CERN. Yes, it's uh, what my studies of CERN, CERN show that it's it's trapping that consciousness that the current global elite are functioning with. And it's expanding it because they're going to build another Hadron Collider soon, and it's even larger. And it, it, this is very dangerous technology they're working oh, with. Oh, wow. Here. Another collider? Yeah, there's going to be another one. It's, uh, look up the ALICE experiment. That's oh, one of the sure. current things going on at CERN right now. And when you think okay. ALICE right away, you think, I'm going down the rabbit hole, right? ALICE in Wonderland, yeah. So I just I highly suggest you study into CERN and Hadron Colliders and Particle Colliders right now because this is not new technology. The Mayans had this technology. They knew exactly what it was, but the Mayans orientated it towards a different polarity. And it's another point I'll make really quick is there's a great video circulating online right now on YouTube about uh, one of these Mayan gentlemen. He's uh, one of the priests there. He talks about all these things, about CERN, about the spirals, about the toroidal geometry. He offers such great insights. I knew exactly what he was talking about just like a few minutes in. He can probably explain these things better than I am. I can right now. Okay. If, and if I you're have, interested, I highly suggest it. I have that link that you sent it to me, so I will post it on this show's Facebook page. So anybody who is... Anybody who is interested, do go to the page. I will have it up as soon right. as I can on there for anyone looking for this uh, video. All right. Well, I uh, I thank for you. Thank you for your time, Miss. I hope you may have me back soon. And I uh, I've been happy to be a guest. And I hope that people will listen and just view the world with an open mind. Well, thanks for coming on, and thanks and for for calling in and oh, joining us. Ah, oh, no problem. And everybody have a good evening. And thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you in a couple of weeks with a brand new episode and new sub uh, subject matter. Bye-bye.
Have a have a, have a lovely evening, everyone, and do hit your follow button if you liked what you heard and would love it to hear more. <laughs>